It was the summer between my 7th and 8th grades at a private Catholic middle school. I was a weird kid, and I went to the school in the 6th grade so I could be with my best friend growing up who had gone there for years. I'll call her Janie. Unfortunately, she was a year ahead of me and I didn't have a lot of friends in my own grade. I would just hang out with her and her friends after school. There was a teacher who started in my 7th grade year, a friend of the literary teacher who worked there. She was eccentric and fun among a group of otherwise standard Catholic school teachers, so when we all heard her friend was coming to teach, we were all excited to have a new teacher we all didn't hate. I'll call him Mr. Trenchman. He was a chubby guy, maybe in his late 30s. He always had his shirt untucked and his hair disheveled and a good amount of stubble on his face. He had really youthful brown eyes that made his students feel like he was one of them and a dry sense of humor that most people ate up after being subjected to the point-blank lessons and lectures from every other teacher in every other class. I didn't have one class with him, but Janie did. She loved being a student, so trusting her, I thought he seemed like a pretty cool dude too. In the summer, Janie told me she was going to help out at the summer camp that he ran. The bus would pick her and the other students up every morning from our school and drop them back off in the evening. She was going for free since she had graduated and was technically a high school student. She and her friends were going to be volunteering as the camp counselors. I was upset. All of the friends I had would be going to his camp every day, and since I wasn't in high school and couldn't be a counselor, I wouldn't be able to afford to go. Mr. Trenchman took pity on me and told Janie to bring me along for free for the day. It was a good time. He'd been running the camp for years, and though everyone knew everyone, they were very inviting and friendly. I got to hang out with my friends all day, helping Mr. Trenchman and all of the older counselors keep the younger kids under control. Mr. Trenchman made me a deal. I could come every day and just pay about 20% of the price of the camp to cover the food and supplies I'd use. The rest of the 80% would be covered by me helping out. I think he knew I was a little lost. A year behind my friends, but too old to really enjoy the camp from a kid's perspective. So I took the deal and worked at the camp. It was a great summer. I got close with everyone there like a family. They'd all known Mr. Trenchman for years. He was a little different than he'd been in school. He was like a grumpy old dad, but he clearly loved his family. The summer ended and classes were about to start up when I'd heard that he would not be returning. He'd been emailing students young female students, asking them to meet him at the school, help him set up his classroom, then maybe go out afterward, maybe go back to his place. I'm not sure of the extent of these emails, I never really wanted to know. One of these correspondences had been with Janie. I almost felt betrayed. We told each other everything and I found out from my mom that she was one of the girls who came forward. I'm not sure what exactly happened next, except I remember my friend telling me that he told his best friend, the other teacher, that he was sick and he needed help or he couldn't stop, something along those lines. All gossip aside, he did end up in the hospital. We're not going to meet again because he died two days later. It was the strangest thing. The creepiest thing about this whole story happened about a month later. I was over at Janie's house, sitting in her room and she went to the bathroom. She took a while, and I didn't have a cell phone or anything else to occupy me, so I grabbed her notebook. We both liked to write a lot. We'd write stories and trade them and give feedback, so I didn't feel like I was really intruding. She'd written pages, probably about 20 to 25 pages, of a story about her and Mr. Trenchman. First they flirted, then they would be sitting too close, and she noticed the look in his eyes. Then he couldn't help himself, and he'd pull her onto his lap. And they had sex. She wrote stories about her and Mr. Trenchman having sex. I didn't read much before I put the notebook down right where I found it. I never mentioned it to her. I never wanted to ask. I never wanted to know. Did something happen before she said something? Was there a possibility she had some part in it herself? Mr. Trenchman had died two days after his hospitalization, like I said. The cause of death suicide. Now he may have been a tormented man, but sometimes I'm thankful that it ended this way. So when I was in my first year in high school, I had a teacher whose name was Dr. Johansson. He used to teach my class civics. He was a special fellow, 
not like other teachers. In the school I attended, teachers were often not close to students in a social way. They were simply there to teach, and that only. Dr. Johansson liked to keep contact with his students, so he decided it would be a lot easier to do so if he had a Facebook account. He started adding people on Facebook from our school and eventually started talking to them. He often posted weird stuff on his wall and commented weird things. For example, one time he posted the song Straight Outta Compton by NWA and wrote, All they say is the N-word, 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 N-word. I don't get it. Of course, some students commented and asked him why he had used the N-word so freely. He removed the post and apologized, blamed it on being drunk. And this was nothing. He started talking to students, mostly boys, and he managed to find some students' numbers and started sending them texts randomly. He would send stuff like, Do you need help with homework? You could come over to my place and I could help you out over a glass of wine. And this he would say to teens that were younger than 18 years old, so according to the law, they are not even allowed to drink. And he pretty much offered alcohol to minors. Remember, he's a civics teacher. He should know this stuff by heart. It's also morals, for God's sakes. Anyway, he never sent me a text, but he sent some weird texts to my friends. Later on, he decided to talk to me. This was a couple of weeks after he had started contacting students like this. He would speak to me on Facebook chat. He would ask me things like, how do you get girls? Do you have a big dick? Do you often get to sleep with girls after your shows? Because I'm an artist, and I found these messages highly disturbing. They became worse, like, you must be such a stallion in bed, you were probably really good, and enter the rabbit hole with me, come on, I'll take care of you. I had no clue what the fuck that meant. And that wasn't even everything. After a while, things started to get out of control. He started asking me to go out with him to the clubs, and I wasn't even of age at the time, and he said he could get me into the clubs with no ID and all would be well. Now, of course, I said no. He then apparently got pissed at me and decided not to speak to me much after that since I had turned him down a few times. He started talking to one of my nearest friends instead. It ended up with Dr. Johansson sending my friend a picture of his ass with the caption, Please, take me from behind and take me hard. Mind you, my friend was 17 at the time whilst Dr. Johnson was around his mid-30s. This was taken to court and Dr. Johansson got his little sentence. He was to do community service for a little while and then he was to pay my friend a fine. That was it. Dr. Johansson still works at a school today and is totally accepted. I find that very wrong, people. Very wrong. A man like that should not be able to get into that line of work again. Things could have gotten much, much worse. I was in primary school, so about 10 years ago. This woman explains that our teacher is ill and she is covering. No big deal, it happens sometimes and we crack on with our work. For the next few hours, she gets stranger and stranger. It starts off with her talking about God and how he can see us and is with us and he talks to her. Then she starts walking around gently squeezing our necks occasionally with both of her hands. Some of us said we needed the loo and went to tell the headmaster instead. He appeared a few minutes later and after trying to get her out of the classroom, ends up having to physically wrestle her out. We were left alone for three hours and no one even moved. Later I was told by my mom that the teacher had a nervous breakdown and she was to never work in that school again. I was about maybe five years old when my parents decided to follow the typical Chinese stereotype of pushing me to play an instrument. Not just any instrument though, it had to be piano or violin. I decided on violin mainly because every other girl in my family already had piano lessons, so I wanted to be a bit different. Since my parents didn't have a great grasp on English, they wanted Chinese speaking instructors which made for quite a few impractical situations given how rare they were. My first violin teacher did not perform house visits, so we had to take the train about 40 minutes to see him every week. He was also pretty harsh and had little patience for a scree-scrawling five-year-old violinist, 
so my parents and I decided to try and find a new instructor. Enter Mr. Chan, a violinist who I would estimate to be in about his mid-thirties. His price was cheap, and he had also made house visits, which we were pretty happy about. Mr. Chan was a soft-spoken man, and as a kid I thought he was the nicest person in the world. Whenever he came by, he would always give me a piece of candy and hug me when the lesson was over. There would be a few things that he did that made me feel pretty uncomfortable though. He often looked at me with these smoldering eyes. As a kid, I thought that maybe those were just what he looked like, but at times it creeped me out because it felt like he was staring into my soul. Also, when instructing me, instead of telling me something like, now put your finger on the E string, he would just tenderly move it for me. If there was any opportunity for him to touch me, he would always do it. Moving my fingers, adjusting my arms and head for posture. All of these things I brushed off mainly because I was a kid who didn't know any better. After all, he was a great violin teacher and I legitimately learned a lot from him. One day, Mr. Chan stopped coming to lessons and we had to get a new teacher. I cried and threw a huge tantrum because I thought he was the nicest guy ever and I missed the candies but they refused to explain why he left. Years later when I was 12, my family decided to break the news to me about what had happened. Apparently, Mr. Chan got arrested for molesting one of his violin students, another girl who was about my age. I wonder if he charmed her in the same way. One of the creepiest events in my own experience that I can recall happened when I was about 9 years old, late 1978 to early 1979 if I am not mistaken, which would have put me in the 4th grade at the time. Just a bit of background information on my school here. It was a newer school for my district at the time, and I guess as an experiment in innovative architecture, the school had no square angles in the walls at all. Rather, for simplicity's sake, Imagine a U-shape where the opening of the U faces onto the parking lot, but where there were hexagons attached to the outer edge of the U. Each of those hexagons was called a pod, and each pod was divided into six classrooms and one central area for that pod, from which a person could see into any of the six classrooms at one time. The playground was the entire area outside the U-shaped collection of pods, first being blacktop and then, further out, grassy field. Critically, this meant that if you were very close to the pods, it was possible for someone else, also close to the pods, to be within 20 feet of you and still be hidden around the bend of the wall. So on this day in 1978 or 1979, my school had open house or parent-teacher conferences. This is when parents were welcome to come to the school and talk with one another, especially with their children's teachers, and to see how their child or children were performing in the school. My mom never missed one of these, and this day was no exception. We went to the school and saw all the teachers and kids and parents gathered in the cafeteria. After whatever general address the principal had to make, everyone went their separate ways to meet one-on-one. -on -one. My mom had teachers to meet for two children, for me and my older brother, who was one year ahead of me. When we met my teacher, Mrs. Holbrook, my mom brought me and my brother into the classroom. She apparently had good things to say about me, and we were done quickly. But when we met my older brother's teacher, Mr. Covey, for some reason my mom told me to go out on the playground and play. My brother remained in the classroom with my mom and his teacher. It was still light outside, so all seemed okay. However, by this time an hour or more had probably passed since the principal's speech ended. Any parents who attended for that only, or who only wanted to meet a single teacher briefly had done so by now and left. The playground area was devoid of people. Naive little boy that I was, I just walked around the pods like I was in my own house and I stayed close to the outer wall of the pods for no real reason. All of a sudden, without hearing or seeing anything to prepare me for what was about to happen, I was pinched across the back of the neck very hard. The hand that held me seemed too strong for me to break away and I didn't even have time to try before a voice whispered in my ear to stay still and not turn around. I nodded as best as I could. Then the voice told me to walk, and it led me around the pod to within sight of the parking lot where a few cars remained. The voice asked me if I saw the green car, the station wagon with wooden paneling on it. I did and indicated so. The voice told me, walk to that car, get inside and wait there. 
Do not turn around. I will be right behind you, and if you turn around, I will know you did. Do you understand me? All the while the owner of the hand and of the harsh whisper squeezed my neck harder at intervals to add emphasis to certain points. The person then sent me walking to that car. I think I know how the condemned dead man walking must feel. I was a naive boy, but not so naive as to believe getting in that car was a good idea. On the other hand, I felt sure that turning around was death if the owner of that voice was still really there. I had gotten halfway to the car when I wound up freezing, unsure what to do. I just stood there crying, which was already an improvement over the extraordinary fear that preceded it. I don't know if I stood there seconds or minutes, but eventually I turned around. Nobody was there. I figured they were back around the pod, peeking, waiting, but my mom was that direction also, so I swung way out into the playground area and walked carefully back around. Somewhere near where I was originally pinched were two boys a year ahead of me, my older brother's age, playing marbles, Roger and another boy whose name I never knew. I avoided them, feeling sure they, Roger particularly, were probably the ones who had pinched me, but I am sure at some point they noticed me passing them at a distance. They did not react at all. In fact, my brother talked about Roger much later by chance in terms that caused me to believe he was a nice guy. Probably as importantly, later reflection led me to consider the whispered voice and the powerful hand to most likely have belonged to an adult male, not to a fellow child. But why did that fool want me in Mr. Covey's car? Mr. Covey was in a conference with my mom, so it was not his doing. My only other guess was my third grade teacher, Dr. Schofield, who had once grabbed me violently when I got up from my chair in class without permission while he was in a bad mood. That dude was eventually arrested in 1980 on suspicion of having molested four boys earlier the same year, a year after my traumatic experience on the playground. I'll never know for sure, but I will always wonder who it was. All throughout high school there was a teacher who I had referred to as Creepy Creep. He deserved this name, and throughout this story I hope you can understand why. It all started in my freshman year. This teacher was an inclusion teacher, meaning he was in charge of taking care of the special needs kids that were allowed to be in the same classes as everyone else. Creepy Creep always seemed alone, and I always felt bad for him, so one day I complimented him on his haircut. I always regretted doing this because, ever since, he was always in the same place as me. Later in my freshman year, I had broken my toe at a haunted house. After I came to the school for the first time after I broke it, he stopped me in the hallway to tell me I should avoid haunted houses. I just laughed it off. But later it hit me that it was really odd that he knew how I broke my toe because I hadn't actually told anyone at school. The next school year, he would always sit with me at my lunch table until my friends showed up. That same year he was running up the stairs and accidentally tripped, which I just happened to see. He seemed fine until he noticed I was one of the students who saw. He started crying and later that day he sat with me at lunch apologizing that he never wanted to embarrass himself in front of me like that. My junior year, he gave me this huge hug on the first day telling me how much he missed me over the summer. This year he would always sit with me at lunch even after my friends would show up. He said my friends weren't true friends if they had had problems with us sitting together. One day at lunch I was talking about how I was leaving early for a dentist appointment. He asked what time I was leaving and I said right after lunch. Then a few minutes later he left, which I was honestly so grateful for. Once I got to my car to leave, it wouldn't start. Creepy Creep just happened to be out there though and offered to give me a ride home. I told him it was fine because my stepdad was on his way to get me and anyways had to get back to school. Creepy Creep told me it wouldn't take any time for him to take me home since my house was just down the road. That's when I got really freaked out because he knew where I lived. Luckily my stepdad showed up just in time. Creepy Creep actually introduced himself to my stepdad saying it was nice to finally meet the man who raised such a beautiful girl. My senior year I ended up going to a different school and I got a new job as a delivery driver. About a week into the job there was a special note on the bottom of the delivery saying, bring the back door and you can just walk in. 
which wasn't too odd to me because sometimes that's a common note on delivery for elderly people who can't make it to the door. So I made it to the delivery and went inside, but it was no other than Creepy Creep. When I walked in, he went in for a kiss, telling me how much he missed me. I was so terrified because not only was this Mr. Creepy stalking teacher, but he also just kissed me. He told me how upset he was to not hear from me on our two-year anniversary, but he said he understood because it's hard to keep in touch after being at different schools. He asked me to quit my job and just stay with him for the rest of the day so we could celebrate our anniversary the proper way. Luckily my boss called yelling at me for taking so long on my delivery, so I told Creepy Creep that I had to go quit my job in person so I wouldn't get in trouble for keeping the money from his delivery, then I would come right back. He was so happy and said he was so excited to see me putting more effort into our relationship. So I quit my job, then went straight home and told my parents everything. I never heard from Creepy Creep ever again. I was in fifth grade. My teacher was a very sweet lady, the kind who would call you baby and sugar and all that. She was very laid back and patient. Then she got ill, flu symptoms. She took a couple of weeks off and some days, but had to come back because she couldn't continuously keep taking off, and she looked worse than what she did when she initially took sick leave. She was very feverish and flu-like, but she was very agitated. She couldn't hold still, had a bad temper, her mouth kind of slacked on the left side, like she had a stroke or something. She was snappy and talking to herself, saying things like, I should probably go to the doctor, and stuff, and biting her nails. She had bitten them so much that they bled. Then things got nasty. One kid, who was slightly special, couldn't understand a worksheet, and she completely lost it. She was throwing stuff and calling him awful names. When I tried to intervene, she came at me and tried to bite me, like she was foaming at the mouth and trying to attack me. By the time people finally found out what was going down, she was on the floor having a grand mal seizure, foaming, her eyes rolling in the back of her head. Sometime later, I found out that she had died shortly thereafter. Trying to find out what happened, police went to her house where they found her dead dog and a dead raccoon somewhere in the house. All three tested positive for the rabies virus. I still have nightmares about her and I always keep my animals up to date on their vaccinations. This happened when I was in ninth grade. I had matured early, so I received a lot of gross comments in 7th through ninth grade. This made me lose confidence in myself, so instead of being very sociable and outgoing like I used to be, I was shy and awkward. I had zero friends, literally zero, so teachers often came up to me and asked me if I was lonely and just showed interest in me because I seemed depressed or whatever. My English teacher's name was Mr. Z. He had the creepiest blue eyes and his smile was even creepier. On the first day of school, he asked us all about ourselves, what our favorite subject was, and our names, but he always called on me even though I never raised my hand. When he asked me, I would speak quietly because everyone stared at me and it made him laugh. He used to call me Goodheart. Towards the middle of the year, I noticed that he showed me a lot of favoritism. If he took away our privileges to go to the bathroom, he would say something like, take this to the office, and then whisper, go to the bathroom if you have to. When we received our progress reports, I would have A's on assignments I have never done. I never told anyone about that because English was a class I had to pass in order to graduate. As the school year went on, I started to realize that he never looked me in the eyes. He would stare at my chest, then my legs, at the floor, etc. And when he did look at me, he barely blinked which made me look away instead. It was very awkward. When I first noticed him blatantly staring at my chest, I didn't think much of it at the time because I'm not very blessed in the chest, so guys usually looked at my butt instead. I just figured there was something on my shirt. The first few times. Towards the end of the year, he started asking me to come into his room during lunch so I could help him grade. When I came to his room, he'd have a movie on and we'd watch that for my lunch. He didn't have to teach a class after, so he let me skip my class afterwards. 
One thing I noticed right away was that there was sex scenes in every movie we watched. He asked me if I wanted to skip and I'd shrug because I wanted to act mature. It started to happen every day. We'd watch a movie every day which all had very awkward sex scenes. At the end of the school year we watched our last movie and this time the scene was very long and very detailed and very awkward. He put his hand on my leg gently and laughed. It'll be over soon, he said. He kept his hand on my leg for the whole thing. Luckily when the bell rang, I left. I didn't say bye, I just left. The reason why I wrote this is because I saw him at Petco, my job, a week ago. I didn't think he'd recognize me. I wear glasses now, dyed my hair blonde, and lost a little weight. I was helping one line of people which had about five people in it and my coworker was working with a line that had two. He stood on my line and waited for everyone to finish even though the other line was empty. When I took his things, avoiding eye contact the whole time, he stared at me. I didn't look up because I didn't want to meet his gaze. Towards the end of the transaction he started asking me about my life, did I like my job, how my family was doing, etc. I just gave him short simple answers while he drilled a hole into my face with his eyes. After we were finished, he smiled and said, I'll be back again, good heart. After freshman year, he was no longer a teacher at my school. I never found out why. This happened with my music teacher when I was in the fifth grade. He was new, filling in for a few months for my normal music teacher, who had just had surgery. He was a lot older, a very big fat guy who was always sweaty and he had fidgety hands and shifty eyes. He was very creepy. In fifth grade, I was already developing and all that good stuff. I also admired my older sister and wanted to be just like her. She would wear these tiny mini skirts and I was dying to get some. Well, my mom wasn't having any of that. She didn't even want her own grown daughter wearing them. She bought me these things called skorts. They were short skirts but had shorts sewn into them on the inside so if anyone ever looked up your skirt or anything, they wouldn't get a peep at the goods. So anyways, he shows up and he creeps me out right off the bat. He's nice enough, he just has this super creepy vibe. He's also really shifty and fidgety. He almost seems nervous to be around children, just really weird overall. Then the comments started. He would harass me about my skirts. He said they were too short. I told them that they had shorts made into them. He told me that he knew I was lying and I'm pretty sure he basically admitted to me that he had looked up my skirt on numerous occasions. He also told me he could see right through me. This went on every day, creepy comments about my clothes and him staring holes in me. He would also single me out to answer weird questions or call me out on something. As far as I knew, he didn't treat any other students this way. I ended up telling my mom, who was a serious mama bear. She went to my principal and they arranged a meeting between my principal and vice principal, the creepy teacher in question, and my mom and dad. My mom is very short and thin but my dad is like 6'2 and 250 pounds of muscle and he is also very protective of me. So I'm not entirely sure what happened at that meeting but I do know my dad never said a word to the man just stared at him the whole time like, I know you creeped on my daughter and I am not afraid to hurt you. My mom also went off on him. She really let him have it. He kept changing his story. I don't think he knew it was being recorded. They ended up playing the recording back and catching him in several lies. He was immediately terminated. I go to a medium-sized school, about 400 students per class. However, we only have about 100 students enrolled in AP Physics every year, so we only have one teacher for the subject. The longtime physics teacher retired, so the school board hired, we'll call him Mr. Sykes. Anyways, from the first day of school, everyone could tell he was, well, different. He would blow up over the smallest things, such as someone writing a formula wrong, just about absolutely go ballistic. The first week of school, he made over five students cry because of his outbursts. My chemistry teacher is the science department leader, so she was very disturbed by these actions. One day, she was going to talk to him about this and if he needs to make some changes or the students need remediation. 
He was not in his room, but she found a pillow and a sleeping bag and some of his clothes hanging in the teacher locker every room has. This seemed a little suspicious, but she didn't overthink it and forgot about it. Fast forward to December, my teacher's son was in the marching band for school and she had to pick him up around 11pm due to a game very far away. She noticed his car was still there. This made her grow more suspicious, because really, what teacher would be there at 11pm on a Saturday night? As the following week went on, Mr. Sykes' outbursts got worse and the students began to fear him more. The following Saturday, my teacher's kids were sick with a stomach bug, so she went to good old Walmart for some ginger ale and on the way home, she decided to drive by the school to see if Mr. Sykes' car was still there. Sure enough, it was. The following week, the physics students were notified that Mr. Sykes would be leaving that week and they could either drop the class without a penalty on their transcript or take it online. The first day of Christmas break, the janitor who was cleaning the school texted my teacher and said Mr. Sykes was standing in his empty classroom staring at the wall. She said that if he was still there when he left to call the principals and possibly the police. He was there, five hours later, staring at the wall. My principal and vice principal and the police had to end up coming and escorting him out. A week later, my teacher was checking the supplies in the room making sure everything was okay for write-up. As she was going through his drawers, she found various items such as razors, rat poison, and acids. We still have no idea what he was planning on doing with them. I read a story about someone's creepy teacher and his lewd actions towards them. This reminded me of my teacher from ninth grade. Mr. Gorey was an English teacher at Davies Technical High School. He gave us tons of work to do to keep us occupied, mostly note copying. From about the first month into school, I knew something was off about him. He once referred to a scenario after reading out loud a story by Edgar Allan Poe where he was a serial killer and he picked girls out of the class who had natural blonde highlights in their hair to demonstrate how a murderer chooses his victims. I was one of the few girls he chose, which I found odd because I had dark brown hair. I always got creepy feelings around him. Because of these feelings and a few other reasons, I transferred to my local high school halfway through the year. It turns out I made the right move. Last year, one of my friends came up to me and told me that Gory was arrested for possession of child porn on his computer and having relations with a 16-year-old student. I'm happy. I trusted my instincts and got out of there. I don't want to give away a lot about my identity, but I will say that this takes place in a small town in Ontario where I grew up during 7th grade. So me and everyone in my class would have been about 12. For the first part of 7th grade, we had a substitute teacher, Mr. I, who was only there until the actual teacher, Mr. C, came back from sick leave due to mental health issues we later found out. Mr. I was great and he left after the winter break. That's when Mr. C showed up. He was kind of a creep from the start. He used to make a lot of little creepy remarks we would let slide, but eventually it escalated. One encounter I recall is that one day during recess, he tried to get me and a friend, Rachel, to say different words for penis and would ask us if we were comfortable with saying things like that, etc. Now, as young girls, we decided to tell our parents, and they were pissed, and called the school, which obviously did nothing about it, because otherwise the rest of this wouldn't have taken place. Fast forward a couple of creepy months. Me and Rachel are in the gymnasium with the rest of our class, about 20 kids. We were doing the gymnastics portion of our gym program. We were halfway through the class and Rachel gets up and goes to the part of the gym where we would leave our shoes. So I turn around to look for her after a bit and to my surprise she is standing there across the gym in shock holding a video camera. Now at this point no one else has really noticed and I haven't put two and two together yet but what happened next made me clue in pretty damn fast. Mr. C who was at the time lounging around the gym not really doing anything sees Rachel with this camera. I swear to God, his face went from not having a care in the world to utter horror in all of a second. 
He grabbed the soccer ball from a nearby rack and chucked it across the room at Rachel. In front of over fucking 20 12-year-old kids, it hit her dead in the side of the face. She dropped the camera, screamed and ran out of the room and into the office. Me and anyone else in the class also ran out of the room in pursuit of her before Mr. C could do who the fuck knows what else. He grabbed his camera and ran out of the school. I never saw him again. Rachel, who happened to live on the same street as me, has friendly parents who talk to mine occasionally. We later learned that they pressed charges and he was convicted of assault on a minor and also intent to harm minors or something along those lines. He had been taping our class since he had begun teaching us. He had dozens of tapes of our gym classes. He would position the cameras in different places to capture the most revealing angles for whatever it was we would be doing that day. Needless to say, we got a new teacher for the rest of the year, which was kind of awesome at least because she let us do whatever we wanted pretty much. In hindsight, everything about him seems so menacing now, from accidentally walking into our changing rooms to extensive health lessons about sex.